Okay, so uh, let me, I should have started with this. Uh, sorry, I forgot. So the main reference I'm following here is this book by uh, Mikhail Damian and Michel Odin called Morse Theory and Floor Homology. There are, of course, other references. Uh, some lecture notes, I'll, I'll miss some for sure. I mean, there are these lecture notes by, by Solomon, the original papers by Floor, and you know, check, check the reference here. I don't want to miss anyone important. So I'll, this is basically what I'm following. Um, so one other thing I, I should have mentioned, uh, maybe those of you who have seen this, is that uh, you can actually find this, uh, you can prove that, that Morse homology is basically the ordinary homology of, of the manifold, but I, I didn't want to go into to that. I want to uh, emphasize these properties of the construction of the Morse homology. Okay, so let's start with the floor homology. So this main reference is for Morse and for floor. Okay. Um, so the idea here is to define this uh, homology using a function defined on a suitable space so that the critical points of this function are in fact one periodic trajectories of, the, of a Hamiltonian system. Okay, so I'm one, my objects, let put that way, that way, are one periodic orbits of a Hamiltonian system. So for floor theory that M need not be symplectic, not at all. Here my manifold M is in fact a symplectic manifold, okay. So again, I'm in that setting where I have a Hamiltonian, time-dependent Hamiltonian, uh, with a Hamiltonian vector field, Hamiltonian flow, and so on. Okay. Um, so first thing, I'll say what it means for a one periodic trajectory of xh to be non-degenerate. So we say that um, x is non-degenerate So this x, you can actually think of it this way, defined here, okay? So x is non-degenerate if, when you look um, to the linearized time one map, uh, this, I'll write it this way, the determinant of this is non-zero. And this basically means that one is not an eigenvalue of d phi 1h, eigenvalue. Uh, so there is a, a geometrical, if you wish, way to, to, to see this condition. So if you think of, let me draw this uh, picture. If you think of m cross m, I'll draw it this, this is m, this is m. And if you think of the diagonal here, so the pairs x, x with x, x, x with x in m, so this. This is in fact, this can be seen as a, a Lagrangian manifold in, in there with the appropriate symplectic form here, but the point is this is in here. And I can look into the graph of this phi 1h, so x phi 1h of x with x in m, which is also a Lagrangian submanifold in here, so let me draw it maybe, suppose the graph does something like this. I, I draw it like this, so this would be the graph. So this condition here tells me that these intersection points, which are the fixed points of phi 1h, um, that the intersection of these two, sorry, 
at these intersections points are, the, these are transversal. Okay, so it's actually an exercise in this book, so let me just state it as a proposition, is that um, phi 1h, well, I define here what it means for x to be non-degenerate. We say that phi 1 of h, or h, is non-degenerate if uh, all one periodic orbits of xh are non-degenerate. Uh, so the proposition is phi 1 of h is non-degenerate degenerate if these two inters intersect transverse. Okay, so let me make some remarks to what happens when H actually, actually does not depend on time, sometimes called an autonomous Hamiltonian. So some remarks here. Uh, what happens when H uh, is not time dependent? So first thing to point out is that um, a critical point, point of H is a periodic solution, a periodic trajectory of XH. So it's actually a constant. periodic trajectory of xh. And if I take a, pre a critical point of h and it is non-degenerate as a periodic trajectory of xh, then it is non-degenerate as a critical point of h. So non-degenerate here in the more sense we gave the non-degeneracy here is this non-degeneracy here, okay? So again, a critical point which is non-degenerate as a periodic, constant periodic trajectory, then it is non-degenerate as a critical point. Moreover, um, when we look into this map locally, so in, in, in coordinates, in local coordinates, this is represented by this matrix exponential of, let me write the J naught of the Hessian of X, of H at X. So this is the Hessian matrix using these local coordinates. This J naught is the, or J, just the J we had yesterday. Uh, hope I'm not off by a sign, but it should be this. Um, and saying that X uh, is a non-degenerate uh, periodic orbit actually means that the Hessian, this Hessian matrix, does not have eigenvalues on 2 pi z. So eigenvalues are not uh, multiples of, integer multiples of, of 2 pi. And as a consequence, we have that if h is sufficiently small, so here sufficiently small or sufficiently c2 small, means that the norm of this Hessian is less than 2 pi, okay? If you want the, um, the uh, exact meaning of sufficiently small, then what happens 
is that we have this. So if uh, I take a critical point which is non-degenerate in the more sense, it will be non-degenerate as a, a periodic trajectory of xh, mainly because of this observation down here. Then we have, we call it star. So in this case, this case meaning h is sufficiently c2 small, um, proving the inequality in the Arnold conjecture, so let me, maybe I should write it here somewhere. of the dimension of the Morse homology of M C2. Okay, Arnold conjecture. So proving this inequality in the Arnold conjecture uh, corresponds to proving what I called here and erased it, Morse inequality. So one can prove that uh, one periodic uh, trajectories of a sufficiently, of a Hamiltonian system given by a sufficiently small h are exactly the constant periodic orbits. And now there is this correspondence between the constant periodic orbits and the critical points of h. So recall that in the Morse inequality we had a lower bound, this lower bound for the number of fixed points of, sorry, critical points of the, of the function, okay? So in this case, again, I'm here. H is not time dependent, proving the inequality in the Arnold conjecture is, corresponds to proving the Morse inequalities. Um, Okay, so before we actually define the function uh, that we need to construct the floor homology, let me uh, give you some assumption, assumptions we'll have on our symplectic manifold. So assumptions on m omega. First one is for all spheres in M, uh, we'll assume that when I integrate omega over the sphere, if you want the symplectic area over the sphere, this must be zero. Okay, this is my first assumption. And the second assumption is again that for all spheres in M, M symplectic manifold here, okay, uh, there exists A symplectic trivialization uh, of the fiber bundle uh, my sphere is called W so W star of TM so I, there is a symplectic way to find a trivialization of the of TM along this this sphere. Uh, and I'll, I'll say during the construction where at least some places where I'm using these, these hypotheses or these assumptions. Okay, so um, let's start with the, with the function. So the function actually will be defined on an infinite dimensional space, so actually call it a functional. And the functional is defined on this space, which I'll denote by LM0, which is the space of uh, contractible loops in M. So this is zero here. Uh, it, it 
it points out we're working with contractable loops here. If I don't write it, I just forgot it, because here I'll, I'm working just with a contractable case. And so loops here, I mean objects in here. So infinity of R mod Z M. So again, our, our idea is to find a function who's cr or functional defined here on this space whose critical points are exactly one periodic trajectories of our Hamiltonian system. Okay, this is where we had. Okay, so how is the this function or functional defined? It's called the action functional, okay? It's defined on the space of contractible loops the following way. So A H of a contractible loop is given by the sum of two terms. The first one measures the area of this, of this loop uh, x. So in order to uh, measure this, this area, uh, I'll consider a, a, a disk whose boundary is this uh, loop, okay? So this U is a disk in my manifold M, such that restricted to the boundary, it's basically given by X, and I'll use this, what we call capping, capping of X to, define, to uh, determine the area of the loop. So this is pullback of omega by U on D2, this is the first term, plus, plus this term that depends on the Hamiltonian. H, X of T, DT. Um, so first remark is that this is in fact well defined. Because there's an ambiguity here in the definition, because I took a capping of this of this loop here. So if I take some other loop, some other capping here, because of this first assumption, right, the, 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 this integral will come the same. This does not depend on the capping, so the issue is just here. And the, the action functional is well defined because of that uh, assumption one. So let's check that the critical points of this are uh, the one periodic orbits of our Hamiltonian system. Whoops. So proposition here. Uh, uh, loop X uh, is a critical point of my action functional if and only if this map uh, is a one periodic orbit of our Hamiltonian system. This is the claim. So in order to do that, let's try and compute this. So this X is a loop, is an element in here. And I want to find what is this derivative where Y is so, uh, tangent vector in here. So actually to see a, a, a tangent vector at the space of loops at uh, this element x, at this loop x, we can think of it, um, so one way to, to see vectors in a tangent space is to see them as class of uh, curves. So if we have a curve here, so this should be in here, right? This US, it's a map that maps T to, let me call now this image 
u of st. And since du ds seen this way, okay, at s equal to zero, uh, is an element at st, is an element of tm at x of t, it is natural to think of this vector or to see a vector field in here as um, a, a, at the point x as a vector tangent to m along this loop x. I have x here, and I should think of y as something defined along this loop here. Okay, and I want to find this derivative. So in order to do that, we actually, so we, 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 we take a curve, right, which at time, a curve in this space, which at time zero is this x, right, which moves in this direction y. So let me take, this is y. So let me take this uh, x twiddle of st. This was just a, how to see the vector field. This x tilde st, so at s equal to zero, it will be my x here. Right, and dx tilde ds, should I? X tilde at s equal to zero is my x, and dx tilde ds at s equal to zero is just y. Um, so this will just be d ds at s equal to zero of h tilde of, of the action functional evaluated at this, okay? And of course, this acts, so we should think of the elements in here, in this space, always attached with a, with a capping, which exists because the, the loop is contractible. And hopefully, I mean, it will happen, the, the construction will not depend on the capping I choose. But I should think of the object as the loop with a, with a capping attached. So this x comes attached with this capping u, okay? And of course, when I take this x twiddle, I should also take this, these u twiddles, the corresponding cappings of each one of these x twiddle, twiddle for each s, okay? Okay, so, um, when I evaluate this, what do I get? I get minus, you twiddle, pull back of omega by this you twiddle on this disk D2 plus the integral of H at X twiddle of S T D T between zero and one. And now I need to compute D S D H X when S equals to zero, right? I just, well, I just wrote it here. So let's look into this term. Let me call this one and this, let's call it two. Okay, I'll just give you the answer of the derivative with respect to S, each one of them. So when I do DDS, when S equals zero of one, uh, so this first term, this is the integral between zero and one. So after some computations. <laughs> This is the integral between zero and one of omega of x dot of t, y of t, dt, and dds of the second term when s equals to zero is the integral between zero and one of omega of yt xh dt. Okay, here you just, here in this case, all, basically what you use is the, the definition of the Hamiltonian vector field to reach this. Let me just make sure this is, yeah. And for this one, actually you use here the Lie derivative and I think Cartan's formula and Stokes and all that and you'll reach there. Okay, so when you add these two, you get that the action functional at x twiddle s, sorry, the derivative, that's what I meant, the derivative of the action 
at x in the direction y is the sum of these two, so integral between 0 and 1. Let me write it as omega of x dot t minus, so I'm switching these two, so it comes with a negative sign, um, y dt. Okay, so if I want to find the critical points, I know that this is 0 if and only if, this is 0 if and only if this part here is 0 for all y. This is 0. This part here is 0 for all y if and only if this is 0 for all y. And by the non-degeneracy of omega if and only if, this happens if and only if x dot is equal to x h of t. Okay. So we have that critical points correspond to solutions of um, my Hamiltonian system. Um, okay, so let me tell you now about the gradient of this, of this function. So again, to, to tell you about the gradient, I need to tell you, uh, I need to have a metric on this space. So again, now, now my space is the space of contractible loops, my, this space. Um, so what we do is first thing, uh, right, recalling what Enrique told us yesterday, fix, a, fix an almost complex structure Uh, J compatible with uh, omega. So this, when I do omega of x, j, y, this is a Riemannian metric. Okay, this is on M, complex structure on M on my symplectic manifold. And with this, we define a metric on the loop space. So these are vectors or on, on, on M. These two are vectors on my loop space. Okay. This will g be just the integral between 0 and 1 of g of x t, y of t, so again, this, this x and this y, we should think of them as tangent vector fields of the manifold defined along the, the loop, small x, the orbit, dt. So we have this metric on uh, here, the loop space. Okay, and again, we define the gradient as usual using this metric. Uh, at x in the direction y, right? Definition of gradient. Um, and uh, since we know that the derivative is given by this expression, right? This integral here, we call that this inner product here is this one, and this g can be written like this, okay? So the fact that I can do, uh, I can rewrite this using the omega and the fact that the action is given by this form, then I know that the gradient of this function this gradient of this function is uh, j. So this at x is j x t x dot t minus d h x t. So if we want to work with trajectories uh, of minus the gradient, just as we did for the Morse case, we can see them as uh, curves in the loop space, which I'll think of um, uh, cylinders, okay? Uh, 
uh, to uh, cylinders in, in, in M. So here is my parameter S, here's my parameter T. T is the parameter along the loops. This is the parameter along the path, if you want. Um, du d s must be equal to minus this j times this term. So let me write it as du d s is equal to plus um, j of u du d t minus x h of u equal to zero. So is this equal to minus this? I'm looking into minus the gradient, okay? Uh, and this is what's called Flores equation. Okay, so recall that in the in the in the Morse setting, we were looking into the space of trajectories, and these trajectories connected critical points of my function. The thing is that these trajectory solutions of this equation may actually not connect uh, critical points of the of the action the action functional. So in order to do that, we'll work with trajectories with what's called finite energy. So let me just briefly say what oh sorry. Arnold conjecture here, okay. Let me just say what the energy is very briefly. Uh, so the energy of one of these trajectories u is defined, I guess as usual, as the integral between minus infinity and plus infinity of the norm of the gradient ds that you can check is the same as the integral of du ds squared ds dt. And <coughs> so suppose we have this u, so this is my u, the parameter s is coming this way, okay? This u is a solution of this equation and suppose it actually connects two critical points of the action functional. So here I have my x and my y, which are loops, which are critical points of the action functional, that is one periodic orbit of the Hamiltonian system. So these two are critical points of the action functional. And this u is connecting them, meaning when s goes to minus infinity, we reach x, and when s goes to plus infinity, we reach um, y. So when we're in this situation, the energy is just given by the difference between the values of the actions of each critical point, okay? So this in particular is finite. And in fact, I won't prove this, but in fact, it is true that when the energy is finite, then this U must connect to critical points of the action function. So now the space of trajectories that I'm working with are these trajectories that have this finite energy and so that they connect to critical points of the action functional just as we had in the, in the Morse case. So here, let me call M the space of these cylinders uh, U in, in M where U is a contractible solution of the our of our floor equation of finite energy. And since I don't have much time, let me just tell you tell you that Gromov proved that this space is, is compact. Okay, so it's a nice space, I guess. Okay, so <clears throat> So we have the space of our trajectories. So in, we need an index to assign to this, to this, to this, to the to each one periodic orbit. So let me try to uh, give you an idea of how that is, of how that is defined. So this index, 
is something called a Maslow type index. And um, traditionally, the Maslow, the Maslow index is defined for a loop on the Grassmannian of uh, Lagrangian uh, submanifolds, but I'm not going to tell you about this Lagrangian <laughs> uh, version, let me put it this way, of, of the Maslow index. So let me just tell you something about this, this index in the, in the case of symplectic matrices. So, but before we do that, let me just tell you the following. So I want to assign this index to a one periodic uh, orbit of our system, right? I want to associate with this x uh, something I'll call the con lysander index of x, which is an integer, okay? And recall that to each one periodic orbit uh, of our system is attached a capping, okay? So using this capping, uh, U, I know there is a trivialization, there is a trivialization of uh, TM of the tangent bundle along the capping, along this disk, okay? And using this trivialization, I can uh, look into, uh, I can look, I can see the linearized flow So this is a map from the tangent space of M at X naught to the tangent space of M at X of T. I can see this as a map, as a path, sorry, from zero, one to the set of symplectic matrices. These are symplectic matrices uh, 2N by 2N, okay? Such that at zero, so at T equal to zero, this is just the identity. So here, this will be represented by the identity matrix identity matrix, okay? Uh, let me put it this. T goes to some matrix A of T. So in fact, this matrix A of zero is the identity. And at T equal to one, so this is the linearized time one map, and I know that one is not an eigenvalue of this, so I'm in the non-degenerate world, okay? So one is not an element of the spectrum of this is not, of this matrix. So with this capping, I look into the linearized flow and obtain this ma uh, path. Symplectic matrices are matrices um, that satisfy this property, which is basically equivalent to the definition given yesterday for if you're in the right basis, but it's this condition. Okay. So what we'll do is actually assign an index to this path, okay, to build that index over there. Um, sorry, I'm seeing time running and so need to decide what to say and what not to say. Okay, so um, let's do the following. Let's look at this space SP2N. Let me just draw it like in a diagram here. Okay, and I know that this matrix, uh, the one is not an eigenvalue of this matrix and we wrote it in the beginning as the determinant of well, it wasn't exactly the same situation, but the idea is that I can write this as the determinant of A1 minus the identity is not, uh, the determinant of that is not zero. So inside this space, let me distinguish here this set, which I'll call sigma, of the matrices A uh, that satisfies the determinant of A minus the identity equal to zero. And what happens is that, so the complement of, of this and here has two connected components, okay? SP to N 
which I'll call plus and sp2n minus, and this corresponds basically where the determinant is positive and this one to where the determinant is negative. Okay. In particular, in here in this sigma, the identity matrix is here, right? Because it satisfies this. Okay. So now let's look to this path. This path starts at the identity and ends in one of these connected components, not in sigma, because one is not an eigenvalue. So the path could do weird things. I'll do it. I'll draw it here just like this. Uh, so this is my psi, and it adds, ends here at this matrix. A of one. Okay, so um, to define this 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 Conley's under index, I actually fix two matrices in here. I'll call this W minus and W plus. This W plus, let me think of it as minus the identity, and this W minus as this matrix uh, defined like this. First uh, element is two. Then I'll have here one half, and after that I just have minus the identity here. I think this one works. Okay. And now, what we do, so here in the, this picture I assume the one was here, but of course it can be also on this side. So if it is on that side, what I'll do is also consider a path connecting this A1 to this fixed, initially fixed W plus, I'll call this uh, path gamma A. Okay, so I should have introduced um, uh, something first, which are the following. So the, we have the set of symplectic matrices, and there are uh, a particular example of symplectic matrices which I'm interested in, which is the following. So there are these matrices that can be written in this form, X. In the, uh, this is a block form. This is x, y, minus y, x. Each one of these is, uh, is n by n, which satisfy x plus i, y, or, or is a unitary matrix one by one in the complex sense. So this is an example of how we can obtain a symplectic matrix. So this un actually lives in here in this as P to N, it's actually a subgroup, okay? And we can think on this UN, this map, which is the determinant. Uh, given by the determinant, uh, so for each uh, matrix on UN, when I compute the determinant, it gives me an element in S1. And there is a way to extend this map to a map in um, SP2N, okay, so in such a way that, of course, the restriction is this map. In fact, in such a way that this map, when I look into the map induced in the fundamental groups, it gives me an isomorphism, which is, which gives me an isomorphism. Now, between the fundamental groups, so pi one of the, this group is isomorphic to Z, the pi one of this one. This isn't used by this map. Now this map, I don't want to go into details, not just because I'm left with eight minutes, it just would not be possible. Um, uh, this map can be defined axiomatically, meaning that you know, one of the properties would be when I think of matrices in UN, it has to be the determinant and has some naturality conditions, normalization, etc. But it also has an explicit uh, expression. However, it's kind of complicated. What I want to point out is that this expression um, depends on the eigenvalues of this matrix and mainly on the eigenvalues with absolute value equal to one. Okay, so let's have that in mind. Okay, so back here. Uh, here, I have my path associated with my loop right here, this psi, okay? And I can, uh, so I have this psi goes from 0, 1 to sp to n. And from sp to n, I have this map rho, this one here. So this psi is here. I have this map rho here. 
and I'll take a lifting of this of this composition to R. A lift, sorry. I don't know, alpha. A lift of a rho composed with psi. And I'll define uh, this index of uh, psi as alpha of 1 minus alpha of 0 over pi. So it ha somehow measures how these eigenvalues, if you want, rotate here in S1. Um, so to define the, the, the index that we want, this mu of psi, we'll take this, I'll call it the mean index of psi plus this mean index of this path here. So if I have here gamma A, I can find this, its mean index. And things work out so nicely that this does not depend on the path I take, just that on the, just depends on the matrix A. So this A is the same one. This A is the same one, okay, sorry. So this is the, the sum of these two things. And this, in fact, lives in Z, and it has to do with the fact that rho, again, I, don't, I didn't give you the definition, but the fact that this happens guarantees that the, basically that this, this is an integer. And so I have an index to this associated with this uh, one periodic trajectory. And again, we took a capping, but this does not depend on the capping because of that second assumption we had on the manifold that I wrote, I don't know, maybe an hour ago <laughs> or so, uh, on the existence of the symplectic trivialization. And so, so this also does not depend on the capping U. Um, okay, so now, um, so now we have our critical points of the action functional, we have an index assigned to it, we have our, we have our trajectories, so basically we can define our complex. So first I'll consider the space Mx. Uh, y, which is given by the, uh, sorry, contractible solutions uh, connecting solutions of the flow equation, okay, connecting um, x, the orbit x to uh, Y, and this with finite energy. Okay, so I can actually guarantee that right, this, as I told you, uh, having finite energy is the same as connecting to critical points. So here they have finite energy, and there's again uh, an, an action of R on this free action. And I can quotient the space mxy by r. I'll consider it L of xy. The main difference between L and m here is that here these solutions are, I'm thinking of them as parameterized curves, and here they are unparameterized. Okay. And again, this thing here has dimension, just as in the Morse case, the difference between the Conley's and their indices of the one periodic orbit. And this thing here, the space L of xy, uh, the dim its dimension is the difference between the Conley's and their indices minus one. Okay, so uh, our vector space is now are, so things are now defined just as in the Morse case, okay? So this is a vector space 
again over Z2 generated generated by one periodic solutions of my Hamiltonian system. So the critical points of the action functional with index k generated by one periodic orbits, well, with Conley's Zender index k. And the, and the differential, I, I won't write it because I don't have much time, I still want to say a couple of things. The differential is again counting the trajectories connecting these two, x and y, okay? And again, we'll have that the differential uh, k composed with differential k plus one is zero, and the idea is basically the same. And so again, we have these three main uh, um, techniques. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I'll need to write, but thank you. Um, uh, uh, to prove that 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 is zero. Oh, sorry, to prove that um, to go through all this construction. Again, we needed some sort of transversality. I didn't go into that. We needed the compactness and the boundary. This boundary condition sometimes in the setting of floor homology is known as gluing because of the, the way that the, this, the space of broken trajectories is, is, comes into place in this, in, this, in this compact manifold L bar. Uh, and um, So, um, so here the difference, again, I had to consider trajectories with, with finite energy. But the, the, the idea of the construction is basically the same. So we, I have the, again, the floor um, uh, homology. Now a priori it depends on the Hamiltonian and on the uh, almost complex uh, structure. Uh, this is just given by kernel of delta k over image of delta k plus one. And all, again, we'd have to see invariance of this, that is the independence uh, in this construction, the independence of this object uh, of the uh, tools we use to construct this, so the Hamiltonian and the almost complex structure. So, back to the Arnold conjecture, so that can actually say something about this the proof of this statement. So let me start here with a theorem which tells me the following. There exists a non-degenerate and sufficiently small uh, Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian function H uh, for which Uh, the, so this is the floor complex, okay, uh, which uh, we used H to build it. This, uh, the floor complex is exactly the same as the Morse complex of this function H, okay. Um, call it, let me use also H. The, however, there's a shift in the index here. So, this is star plus, plus n. So recall when h is, uh, I made all these remarks in the beginning about h which are, uh, which is um, uh, time independent, does not depend on time. Right, that the critical points of the Morse function correspond to constant periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian system and if h is small then there is actually equivalence in the non-degeneracy notions of these two and in fact there will be a correspondence between the traject the Morse trajectories and the floor trajectories uh, and it's possible to prove 
this, however, so we recall that we had this path um, exponential of t times j Hessian of x. So actually, it can be proved that the, the, the index of this path, and hence the index, the conley zender index of the orbit, uh, small x, um, is equal to the, let me see if I don't mess up with signs, the Morse index of x see, seen as a critical point of the function minus n. Okay, maybe I should have mentioned this when I talked about the sign. So that's, there's why this, there's this shift here. Um, and so now, using this independence of the, I didn't write it down, the independence of the floor homology regarding these two objects. Does not depend on the Hamiltonian, right? It's a invariant of the, of the manifold. The fact that I have this relation for h, for some h sufficiently small, okay? I get that the, the floor homology and the Morse homology are basically the same, and so using the same argument as we used in Morse inequalities to prove the Morse inequality, we get the, this, this inequality here. We use the same, the same type of, of argument. Okay, so I wanted to make this, this um, dictionary, you know, correspondence between uh, the way we proved the Morse inequalities and this inequality here. It's about the same uh, uh, argument using the invariance of the floor homology and this relation. I'll just, one minute, okay? <laughs> I'll just point out uh, um, um, a couple of things. Is that I had these assumptions on the manifold but there can actually be somehow relaxed, let's put it that way, uh, by now, nowadays. We, I, uh, I just assumed them here to make my life easier. <laughs> uh, the second point is that you can actually work with non-contractible uh, loops. We we'll still have to adapt the argument. The cappings will be different, okay? And there are some, um, there's a version of this floor homology for, uh, Lagrangian submanifolds. I didn't. I didn't want to say something about this, but I don't have time. But to work to do that work with intersection points of of Lagrangian submanifold, there is a way to um, uh, uh, study these intersection points as critical points of this sort of uh, uh, <laughs> action functional. Bear with me, it's not exactly like that, but uh, that's the, the main idea. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them either now or later, I mean, up to you. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>